The Consoling Thoughts of St. Francis de Sales Consoling Thoughts on Eternity Chapter 9 How Much the Thought of Heaven Ought to Console Us The end of man is the clear vision and enjoyment of God, which he hopes to obtain in heaven. Blessed, then, is he who employs this short mortal life to acquire an eternal good, referring the transitory days here below to the day of immortality, and applying all the perishable moments which remain to him to gain a holy eternity. The true light of heaven will not fail to show him the secure course and to conduct him happily into the harbor of everlasting felicity. Note My son, lift up your eyes to heaven to see your reward cried out the heroic mother of young Symphorian, expiring in the midst of the most cruel torments. There is no pain that the sight of heaven does not sweeten, no sorrow that it does not soothe, no tears that it does not wipe away, no murmurs that it does not appease. There is nothing so bitter, but it becomes sweet in the hope of eternal goods. The Apostle Paul himself often thought on this glorious recompense to find encouragement in the midst of the tribulations which pressed upon him from every side. The time of my deliverance draws nigh, he said to one of his disciples. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. It only remains for me to await the crown which is reserved for me, which the Lord as a just judge will render me on the great day. End of note. The rivers flow incessantly, and as the wise man says, return to the sea, which is the place of their nativity, and is also their last resting place. All their motion tends only to unite them with their original source. O God, says St. Augustine, Thou hast created my heart for Thyself, and never can it find repose but in thee, what have I in heaven? And what do I desire on earth but thee, my God? Thou art the God of my heart, and my portion forever. Behold in detail a few points which we have to believe on this subject. Firstly, there is a paradise, a place of eternal glory, a most perfect state, in which all goods are assembled, and where there is no evil a world of wonders replete with felicity, incomparable in happiness, infinitely surpassing every expectation, the house of God and the palace of the blessed, a most lovely and desirable city, and so precious that all the beauties of the world put together are nothing in comparison with its excellence, so that no one can conceive the infinite greatness of the abysses of its delights. Consider that, for an eternity, the fortunate souls there will enjoy the happiness of seeing God give himself all to all, and hearing the eternal Son say benignly to his Father, My Father, I wish that those whom thou hast given me may be eternally with me, and that they may see the glory which I have had from thee before the creation of the world. And turning to his dear children, Did I not tell you? that whoever would love me would be loved by my Father, and that we would manifest ourselves to him. Then this holy company, inundated with pleasure in the bosom of the divinity, will sing the eternal Alleluia of joy and praise to its Creator. Secondly, the soul, purified from all sin, entering heaven, will that instant behold God himself, unveiled, face to face, as He is, contemplating by a view of true and real presence the proper divine essence, and in it infinite beauties. The sweet St. Bernard, while yet young, on Christmas night, waited in the church until the commencement of the divine office. As the poor child waited, he fell into a light slumber, during which, oh my God, what a happiness! He saw in spirit, and the vision was quite clear and distinct, how the Son of God, having espoused human nature, 
and become a little infant in the bowels of his mother, was, with an humble gentleness and a celestial majesty, virginally born of her sacred womb, a vision which so filled his heart with jubilation that all his life he had a tender recollection of it, and the thought of the mystery of the nativity of his master always brought him spiritual joy and extraordinary consolation. Alas, if an unsubstantial vision of the temporal birth of the Son of God so powerfully ravished and delighted the heart of a child, what will it be when our minds, gloriously illumined by the blessed light of glory, will see that eternal birth by which the Son proceeds, true God of true God, divinely and eternally born of the Father? Then will the soul be deified, filled with God, and made like to God, by an eternal and immutable participation of God, uniting himself to it as fire does to the iron which it penetrates, communicating its light, brilliancy, heat, and other qualities in such a manner that both seem one and the same fire. As God has given us the light of reason, by which we can know him as the author of nature, and the light of faith, by which we consider him as the source of grace. So he will give us the light of glory, by which we shall contemplate him as the fountain of beatitude and life eternal. Yet a fountain that we shall not contemplate from afar, as we now do by the light of faith, but a fountain that we shall see by the light of glory, plunged and lost in it. Thirdly, the soul will be happy forever amid the nobility and variety of the citizens and inhabitants of that blessed country, with its millions of millions of angels, of cherubim, of seraphim, its troop of apostles, of martyrs, of confessors, of virgins, of holy women, whose number is without number. Oh, how happy is this company! The least of the blessed is more beautiful to behold than the whole world. What will it be to see them all? They sing the sweet canticle of eternal love. They ever rejoice in an unceasing gladness. They interchange unspeakable contentments, and they live in the consolations of a happy and indissoluble society. But, O oh God, if sincere human friendship is so agreeable, what will it be to behold the reciprocal love of the blessed. Certainly, the hearts of the citizens of heaven will be abyssed in love through admiration of the beauty and sweetness of such a love. Fourthly, in paradise, God will give himself all to all, and not in parts, since he is a whole which has no parts, but still, he will give himself variously, and with as many differences as there will be blessed guests. As star differs from star in the brightness, so men will be different, one from the other, in glory in proportion as they will have been different in graces and merits, and as there are probably no two men equal in charity in this world, so there will probably be no two equal in glory in the next. Consider how delightful it must be to see that city where the great king sits on the throne of his majesty, surrounded by all his blessed servants. There are found the choirs of angels and the company of celestial men. There are found the venerable troop of the prophets, the chosen number of the apostles, the victorious army of innumerable martyrs the august rank of pontiffs, the sacred flock of confessors, the true and perfect religious, the holy women, the humble widows, the pure virgins. The glory of every one is not equal, but nevertheless they all taste one and the same pleasure, for there is the reign of full and perfect charity. One ray of glory, one drop of the love of the blessed, is of more value has more efficacy and merits more esteem than all other kinds of knowledge and love which ever could enter into the hearts of mortal men. Fifthly, 
notwithstanding the variety and diversity of glory, yet each blessed soul, contemplating the infinite beauty of God and the abyss of infinity that remains to be seen in the same beauty, feels perfectly satisfied and satiated and is content with the glory it enjoys, according to the rank it holds in heaven, on account of the most amiable divine providence which has so arranged everything. What a joy to be environed on all sides with incredible pleasures, and, as a most happy bird, to fly and sing forever in the air of the divinity. What a favor! After a million of languors, pains, and fatigues endured in this mortal life, after endless desires for the eternal truth never fully satisfied in this world, to see oneself in the haven of all tranquility, and to have at length reached the living and mighty source of the fresh waters of undying life, which alone can extinguish the passions and satiate the human heart. Note, quote, The predestined are more happy in heaven than the reprobate are miserable in hell, God being more generous in rewarding than severe in punishing. In its effects, mercy every way surpasses justice. Yes, the joy of the blessed in heaven is immense, and this is precisely what rendered the realization of the rich man's desire impossible when he asked for one drop of water from heaven to be laid on his tongue by Lazarus. A single drop of the celestial joy falling into the abode of the reprobate would suffice to extinguish its flames and to convert into sweetness all its bitterness. End quote by Ventura. Back to the text. We ought always to have the eternal days in our mind, and in consideration of them, nothing will appear impossible. Did not David say, Because of the words of thy mouth I have walked in hard and difficult ways? And what are the words of the lips of our Lord, if not the words of eternal life? St. Peter had reason to say, To whom, O Lord, shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. This is that eternal life to which our Lord in Genesis wished to move Cain, when he said to him, If thou do well, shalt thou not receive recompense? This is that eternal life for which the good man Jacob called himself a pilgrim. The days, he answered King Pharaoh, of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty years few and evil, and they are not come up to the days of the pilgrimage of my fathers. I am mindful of the ancient days, and I have in my thoughts the eternal years. Eternal life, when well considered, is sufficient to move the hardest hearts. In the beginning, during the first fervor of the Order of St. Dominic, there was a preacher named Reginald who preached at Boulogne with incredible fruit. There was, in the city, a learned and rich man who, for fear of being converted, would not attend a single sermon, though others flocked in crowds. At length, however, he ventured on St. Stephen's Day, and hearing a discourse on the words, I see the heavens opened, he was converted and became a religious. For eternal life, David inclined his will and heart to observe the commandments of God. St. Augustine wished to retire among his religious before being made bishop. St. John the Baptist dwelt in the desert. Here ends the reading, and thanks be to God.